So that's that. Okay, uh, so to get started, I'd like to begin by first saying that the University of Alberta respectfully acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for the diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, the Blackfoot, Métis, Lakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwa, Salto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Before introducing our speaker, I also just wanted to mention that uh, our next visiting uh, artist talk will be October 12th at two o'clock. It'll also be by Zoom uh, and it will be Takeshi Takano. Uh, many of you may know Takeshi is um, a visiting artist here in the department from Japan. And he'll be here till March 31st. So please mark your calendars for that. Okay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our, our visiting speaker today. Uh, Laurie Blondeau is an interdisciplinary artist work, working primarily in performance and photography. She is Cree Salto Metis from Saskatchewan. Her mother is Cree Salto from uh, George Gordon First Nation located on Treaty 4. And her fa late father was Metis from Labrette, Saskatchewan. Blondeau holds an MFA from the University of Saskatchewan. In addition to her extensive exhibition history, Blondeau is the co-founder of the Indigenous Artist Collective Tribe and has sat on the advisory panel for the Visual Arts for the Canada Council uh, for the Arts. Blondeau's professional and artistic accomplish accomplishments were recognized with the Governor's General Award in 2021. Uh, Blondeau exhibits extensively uh, nationally and internationally and many of you may be saw her work here in Edmonton uh, in the Borderlines exhibition at the Art Gallery of Alberta in 2021. Uh, with that in mind, I want to extend a special thanks. I know, uh, Laura, you're very busy and have lots on your on the go all the time, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak to our students and our department today. So thanks very much, and I'll end there and turn it over to you. Thank you. Um... I just want to thank Sean for inviting me to do this artist talk. I have to admit, this is my first artist talk on Zoom. I have done conversations, I've been on panels, but I've never done an artist talk. So you'll have to bear with me. Um, I'm just going to jump into it. Um, I'm going to read something and then we'll go into the visuals. So this is um, just an artist statement. Uh, that I kind of use as a general one. So storytelling has influenced every aspect of my practice and making up for a lot of what I produce visually. I take stories, whether they are old stories, contemporary and make them into visual culture. I see what I do with my art practice as high tech storytelling and in contemporary time. As an artist who is, who is an Indigenous woman, I cannot help but in be influenced by the stories of the day and how it impacts my worldview. The images of the Indian princess and squaw have had a significant impact on society's perception of Indigenous women and serve as an inspiration for most of my work. Surprisingly, we still see these popularized images of the Indian princess being created by the media. You can find these images being created on the internet or see them, see people at different events from concerts, sporting events to fashion designers recreating these images and perpetuating the stereotype. You can find these images being sold in museum souvenir shops across North America. They are testament to the general public's idealized perception of a beautiful indigenous woman as being ex exotic and hard to find virtually non-existence. The other side of the Indian princess, of course, the squaw, another society's iconic scapegoats meant to desensitize both the general public's view of indigenous women. My work explores the influence of popular media, culture, contemporary and historical on indigenous self-identity, self-image and self-definition. I have been exploring the impact of colonization on traditional and contemporary roles and lifestyles of indigenous women. I de deconstruct the image of the Indian princess and the squaw 
and reconstruct an image of absurdity and insert these hybrids into the mainstream. The performance personas I have created refer to the damage of colonization of colonialism and to the ironic pleasures of displacement and resistance. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I would start off with um, a video. I just finished, had a show at um, Plugin Art Gallery here in Winnipeg. And it was a survey show and they also commissioned a new uh, installation that I made during COVID, inspired by COVID, but also inspired by uh, the work I have been doing around um, with rocks and rock art in, in the prairies. Um, so it's about seven minutes and it's kind of like a virtual tour, I guess. Uh, okay. I'm going to share my screen. Can everybody see it? Yeah, it looks good, Laurie. Okay.
Okay. Um, so, so that was my exhibition. Um, I guess I, I was wondering, maybe I'll show another video of a performance. Uh, during the pandemic, I've refused to perform stream online or through Zoom. Uh, for me, it was an obvious decision to make because I just um, find performance I even have a hard time watching performance on video of myself, and I find video makes performance very flat, and you don't get the, the experience that a live action or a live performance will bring to an audience. But in, I was invited to participate in, uh, Jamie Isaac curated a show at the Winnipeg Art Gallery called Born in Power. And she asked me if I would remount a performance um, I originally did in 2002. And it's a performance that's based on one of my mother's um, residential school stories. Uh, and from her experience, she attended two, two schools. She began at the George Gordon First Nation Residential School, which was run by the Anglican Church. And she's the oldest out of seven kids. Um, so she had started residential school in the late 30s. And the Anglican school, the school where she started, they really didn't have a lot of money and the kids were starving, which I think was probably common in all residential schools. So my grandfather converted his family to Catholic so he can because he had heard somewhere that the Catholics had more money. And so he could send her to the Catholic residential school, which was Muskaugan. And she went there until she was 17. Um, and of course, with my, my mother actually was kind of a collaborator with me on this performance. And it took me two years to make it. And I did it for my MFA final thesis show. And my mother was there and it was, she actually couldn't stay for the performance because it just triggered her. But she said, keep on, you know, I had to stop the performance and it totally changed what I was gonna do for the performance. But I went out and I finished it with um, making alterations as I was performing it because when I came out, everybody that was sort of in this enclosed fence pin I had made, we're all crying and I originally wanted to, at the end, close them into um, hammer it shut so they couldn't get out. But I, I didn't do that. And then I just left the piece um, for, uh, in 2018, I remounted it for a show at the University of Saskatchewan. And I finally got to do it um, how I originally planned it. And my mother said, well, I'm not coming to it. And I said, I understand you don't have to come to it, mom. And I also changed it where I recorded the audio um, instead of speaking, doing orally the story. And then, which was interesting because it, you know, going that many years later, doing a piece again was interesting and in how it had changed. Um, in 2018. So Jamie Isaac invited me to remount that. And I said, well, we're not gonna stream it. And she goes, what if we videotaped it and then we'll stream it. Then we'll just, people can watch it from the WAGS uh, website. And I said, okay. And so we did this in March and <clears throat> all the galleries here, we were in a big, getting close to going into a big lockdown, our third one. And um, so we went to the gallery, there was five women. So there was three videographers, uh, young indigenous women. They have a company here in the city. And then I hired uh, a, a young indigenous artist here in Winnipeg. I um, hire her as my assistant sometimes. So there was her and there was Jamie and then the prep, the preparatorial woman. And I thought, oh, this is just going to be like making a video. I didn't think I'd have the same experience that I do when I do a live performance. But it was. It ended up be feeling like a live performance because it was with just five people watching. So um, 
so I guess I just want to give trigger warning to people about this piece that we're going to watch because um, it has those elements. Um, okay. She told me a story about when she first went to school. She was six years old. She was the oldest of all the children in her family. I asked her what it was like. She didn't talk about it much. She told me her grandparents used to go visit her. I asked her if her mother would. She said no. I always wonder what it was like for my grandmother having to send her firstborn to the school. I think about being a mom and having to drop off your six-year-old in this foreign place, this brick building. The first school she went to was Anglican. was located on the reserve where my mother grew up. She told me that my grandfather converted them to Catholic because they were starving and the Anglicans didn't have a lot of money. So he converted them to Catholic. So she could go to another residential school. The Catholics had more money. She told me they still starved, but they had more food. She told me about the times when they would sneak out of the dorm and go into the kitchen to steal food because they were starving. She told me she ran away twice. Once by herself and the second time with her sister. She told me it was winter time. She told me
she always tried to be positive about her experience in that school, in that brick building. I asked her if it was so good, what were you running from? She told me she wanted to be free. She just wanted to run and be free. It wasn't that she was running away from something, it was what she was running to. She told me her grandparents used to go visit her. I asked her, did Kukum go visit you? She told me, not often. I think about how hard that must have been for my Coco to leave her child in that place. She said when her grandmother and grandfather would come visit, that the old lady would bring a blanket for her and one for them. They had to visit with a fence in between them. They weren't allowed physical contact. Now I understand why my grandmother didn't go visit her. She said they would sit and have bannock and tea and visit with this fence in between them. I asked her what it was like to be there. She told me she hated the smell. It smelled like disinfectant and bleach. She told me they didn't learn a lot there. She told me the majority of their day was cleaning and maintaining that building, that brick building. She told me the thing she missed most about home was the smell. I think about that smell. It would have smelled like wood stove burning poplar. She told me that her grandmother would throw her sweater over the fence and she would wrap it around her body and just smell the sweater. She told me the thing she missed most about home was that smell. She told me
Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, th so that's that performance. But when I do it live, it's very different with an audience. And um, so that's probably the only performance I'll do during COVID until I can have an audience again. Um, I'm just thinking, thinking if anybody has any questions, we can um, go into the questions. Any questions? I, I, I maybe can dive in on one, Lori. Thank you for sharing that piece. It's so powerful. Um, in, in writing, making the writing for that piece, is that something you did, uh, like was it well edited before your performance or do you kind of intuitively change it each time it's performed? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I don't ever write down what I'm gonna say for performance. And um, that piece, it's just this, I think I said it in a different way than I did when I was saying it live at, at the first time I ever did it. And so recording, I think, um, gives you an opportunity to sort of play with how you're saying it, how you're speaking it. And I think that's what I love about pre-recorded texts or stories. Um, so yeah, I don't, I, I don't write it down. Um. I, I have to say, I, it's it's very powerful as a video too. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Any other questions from anyone at this point, or Tanya had her hand up. Okay, Tanya. There we go. <laughs> um. Uh, it's a powerful piece, and of course, anybody who has any association will really feel about that. Um, my aunt and my grandma, both who went to residential schools, and my grandmother as well, uh, they used to live in Punishai. Okay. And, yeah. Did they go to Gordon's? No. Oh. And they went to, uh, I don't know why the hell they would live in Punishai. It's right, maybe I should explain that for other people, but uh, Punishai is a small town and the Gordon Reserve, for some reason, there's a small town beside this residential school. But, you know, that, um, that steel slide that was on the side of the building, you know, this is scary. Do you know which one I'm talking about? in the town no or connected to the school oh okay yeah i know what you're talking about i don't remember the steel slide though oh yeah it's uh there was a steel slide and it you know went right to the playground kind of area but it was just didn't seem like a fun slide <laughs> but um we'd, we'd stay there in the summer when um, my grandma was so you know it's it's not a nice building. It's it's just for everyone. It's that's where that's where Lori's um, grandma was, or mom. Um, um, I, my question is about um, this this whole talking about calluses and what's going on. We we had the DRC that whammied us. Uh, and that took that took a lot of generations just to you know just to deal with that and just as soon as we get rid of the TRC we have this calluses thing and it seems to be making it all bring, bring it up again um, I'm just wondering what your experience is with the echo of uh, the children that are coming um, to light, like I me, mean, we've already know about it for you know eons, but um, it's weird having the nation and the world 
take a look at it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any comments on that. Oh yeah, I I, I don't know how um, as Indigenous people we can't come on comment on it because it affects us in a very profound way. Um, the performance piece that I made, uh, it began when the, my mother started going through the process at the time, it wasn't called TRC, it was called The Common Experience. And I went to, um, she was just beginning to go through that because that piece I did in 2002 and then 2007 is when she did her testimony. She didn't do a public one, she did a private one. Um, so I was in um, British Columbia when the 215 in Kamloops made national news. And I, it took me two days to call my mother because I just knew it was not gonna be um, you know, it, I just knew. And so I finally got, you know, okay, the strength, the caller, and I called her and of course we were both crying. And, um, she told me her story of Muskaugan that she goes, she remembered when she was a child that they moved, she remembers they moved graves because they were too close to the playground. And that's the graves because they did a search at Muskaugan already. And I think there's 35. Uh, graves found. Um, and I remember saying to my mom, because I was staying with my son who lives in, was living in Vancouver, and I just said, oh my God, what if they now check every residential school in Canada? And I just thought, like, I didn't want that. I just thought, I don't know if we can handle this. Like, it's so huge. And when I talked to my mom, like, I just said, like, I, I'm really scared that they're going to check every school now. And what is, you know, where is that taking us as a people who are so um, affected by the generational trauma from residential schools? And she goes, I want, she goes, they have to, they have to check every school and she goes, that's how, for me, that would be the healing because we knew this. We try to tell people that there's these graves and she goes, nobody would listen to us. So even know how hard it is to find out when we find out and it, I think she had a really good point, you know, because we do have to do some kind of healing and it's going to take another five generations, you know, to get through this. So, um, but for me, I guess this piece, are you my mother? And the reason I called it, are you my mother? Cause I, I, I pictured when my grandmother would have went to residential school, she was born in 1914. So she would have went in the like 1919. And I, I figured the, the picture of the queen that would have been in the residential school would have been Queen Victoria. Um, and then when my mother went, I think it would have been, you know, still her, but then would have changed to Queen Elizabeth at some point. And, um, and for us treaty people, you know, that's what they called Victoria was the great grandmother. So I just called the piece, Are You My Mother? Um, because of who the queen was at the time. Um, yeah, so I, I just think it's, we have a long road ahead of us and it's interesting how something like this can be in the news and be in international news and then just disappear. And it's because of our people, why we will keep it alive until, you know, and they'll keep on counting, so. Thank you for the question, Tanya. Are there other questions? Maybe while we people think, I'll, I'll ask another. The uh, 
the great video at the beginning that um, actually I have two questions. One sort of flat footed, I apologize. The, the video of the, the exhibition, the first two pieces, how were those done? You know, a right uh, it's just a cyanotype and a Van Dyke. Oh, okay, I thought they so might be. It's yeah. a photo process, yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to check that. And those um, those two pieces, the, the images of Belle Sauvage, who's another one of my personas, um, the cowgirl, who's actually Betty David's grandmother. Um, and the... <sighs> The quote I have on those images, it says, the more they were in tune with the times, the more they drank. And I, I tend to watch a lot of sort of history documentaries. And I was watching this documentary on New York City when it was first founded. And the narrator had said, the more they were in tune with the times at the beginning of the city becoming a city, the more they drank. And I really, I remember writing down that quote and thinking when it came to First Nation people, right? Like the more we had it, it had contact with settlers and more um, we were introduced to the culture of settler people, you know, alcohol was introduced. And I think the more we were colonized and slowly put on reserves, the more we drank. So I just kind of looked at it like how you know it could could um, pertain to to indigenous people at the point of contact. Yeah, they're great, great pieces. Um, my my other question was about the larger photographs, which I know I've heard you speak about before, and they're wonderful pieces. And I wonder if you might say a few things about about those works as well. That, that work is called Asinia Squale, which means rock woman in Cree. Um, I've always, since I was a child, um, my parents used to take us on holidays in, our, in a camper and, you know, driving. But we would usually go to a lot of sort of historical sites um, and indigenous historical sites, you know, Medicine Wheels and uh, the Milk River. We went and looked at all the rock art when I was a kid there. And then where my mom grew up on our reserve, the Carlton Trail went right by her house. So when they first were settling the reserves, people when they first set up the reserves, people's houses were way out back from the main road because and really far apart from each other because they didn't want, you know, they didn't want them socializing. And so this was way, we still go out to where her where she grew up and we used to go camping there in the summer and there was teepee rings because it was at a really high point on, on the reserve where you could see really far and because of the trail. And um, so I just always been um, really interested in, in these rock formations that our people have left and a lot of them have been destroyed. Um, some of our very sacred stones have been blown up, like as recently as 1966. And so that was, um, and I look at these grand, we call them grandfathers. I look at these grandfathers as being our history keepers. And that's our history, like whether it's medicine wheel or TP rings or, you know, and um, these, these sites are becoming more and more protected. Um, I have a cousin, her and her husband belong to the Saskatchewan Archaeology Society, and they go out and they find old medicine wheels. And what they do is then they register them with the Archaeology Society of Saskatchewan, and then which protects them from mining companies or oil companies that they can't touch them. Um, so Asinia Squayo is, um, is about Mistassini, which was a rock that was blown up in 1966. And it was a place where, um, it was a huge gathering spot and it's where they dammed the South Saskatchewan river at the Gardner dam. 
And um, so before, like before contact, that's where um, Cree, Soto, Assiniboyan, we would all gather for the summer. It was a huge gathering spot. And this sacred, and mostly probably because of the sacred stone, Mistassini, which was just a huge, huge rock. And then when they were building the dam and they were gonna flood the, the land to make Lake Diefenbaker, um, and it was gonna open up this dam in 1967, which was the centenary of Canada. And um, they wanted to blow up the stone. So there was Wilford Tatusis, who's passed away now, but he was, um, people were protesting that they not blow up the stone because people were still using it for ceremony. And Buffy St. Marie, I think also too, um, was doing what she could to protest it. And what they ended up doing is they blew it up in the middle of the night. And so the stone, one of the stones that I was standing on is a shard that they kept. And it now sits at Elbow, Saskatchewan, um, in the, where the marina is. And it has two um, plaques on each side, one in Cree, one in English, that tells the story about the rock. And, um, and you know, it was a pretty big piece of rock that I was standing on. So you can tell how big it would have been. And then in 2014, Wilford Tatusa's son um, went with a diving company to go see if they could find the rest of the rock under the water, and they did. But it was just like pieces, right? So, um, yeah, so that's what that piece is about. And I think the power of the rock, that's why I wanted to wrap myself in red, because it's a color of ceremony, it's a color of power. You know, it has a lot of different meanings to it, so. Great, thanks for that. Uh, uh, Joan, you have a question, yeah. Yeah, uh, th thanks so much, Laurie. Um, so, so interesting to, to, to hear you speak and really moving too. I had, I had two questions. One, um, I think you already begun to answer. I wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about rocks and I've heard you talk about, about uh, your piece where you're standing on the rock before, but there is also a rock in, in the exhibition you showed. And I, I wondered if, if um, that's directly related. Um, I think I, I saw that in the plug-in gallery exhibition, there was a, a large rock there that related to that same piece in some way? Um, I think it's just my use of rocks in my work also. And I think rocks just carry some power. Just a minute. <coughs> Sorry. And um, so my show was planned, um, I think, before I moved here. So it was like three years in the making and they I always knew that they were going to commission a new piece. And I was trying to figure out what the piece was going to be like I had some ideas like I knew I wanted a big rock. But then we went into this big pa global pandemic and you know we're all stuck in our houses and watching the news incessantly. Um, and when the pandemic became a pandemic, I was flying to Australia with a, a group of Indigenous artists for the Sydney Biennale and a conference that Wanda Nanabush had put together. And so when we landed, we found out it was a global pandemic. So then we all had to turn around and I think we were there for five days Then we had to come back. And then we all ended up in our houses and just watching the news and watching um, the government of Manitoba doing their news conferences, like the premier and the doctor, and they were always with these green curtains behind them and these flags. And it's the, so the green represents government for me. And, and so the, I knew I, the rock was the only thing that I knew that I wanted to have. So through the pandemic, I did, I came up with the, idea for the rest of what the rest of the installation was going to be. And I also knew I wanted to have an audio piece in, in, in it. So for me, the rock is having its own news conference. 
<laughs> and um, and the flags uh, represent, you know, they're just white white flags with ribbons instead of having the the cord that most flags have on them. I put ribbons, and the audio is uh, urbanscape sounds like birds. There's a train. Uh, I wanted sounds that sort of made me feel nostalgic and trains really make me feel nostalgic because we're in Librette. I grew up there for the first eight years of my life and uh, we live close to the train tracks. And here in Winnipeg, where I live in the north end, the train tracks are really close. And so I still hear the train. So when I was working with the, my audio person, who also lives really close to me, I said, I want the train. So he got some really good sounds of train and then there's rain. But um, I think it's just part of working with stones. Like I think there's quite a bit of my work that where I work with stones, I collect stones. I travel to go see rock, rock art, um, places where there's um, teepee rings, you know, I, it's just like, it's also a feeling of longing when I go to these sites, because it's just like, uh, I just wonder what it was like, you know, before white people came here and, you know, they just lived in these villages. Um, there's a place just outside of Eston, Saskatchewan, and there it's this, it's owned by these two old guys i i don't know i haven't been out there for a long time but they've preserved this site on their land and there's like 20 teepee rings there's an effigy of a man that you can only see from the air a turtle um but it's a i don't know i just get really um longing when i go to these sites and i think that's kind of me wanting to work with rocks did that answer your question? We more than answered it, yeah. Okay. And I loved hearing you speak about the ground, the grandfathers too, that notion of the, the rocks holding the, the history as well, uh, which mm -hmm. is part of, of what you're talking about here. Yeah, thank you. They were huge in our societies on the plains because, you know, we use them for cooking, we use them for ceremony, we use them to, for our houses, our, you know, our lodges, our teepees. They were just, and it's weird because all these rocks that we have in the in the plains at, were caused because you know they came, they came from outside of this. It was washed. They were all washed up here in a from a glacier. So. Great. Any other questions? Tanya, you have another one? And then Lindsay, it looks like you might have one too. You could be next, yeah. But Lindsay, uh, Tanya said you can go first. <laughs> Tanya? Okay. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, hi, Lori. My name hi, is Lindsay. Lindsay. How's it going? Thanks yeah, so much for your talk. <laughs> okay. So um, the past two years, I've been working um, with a moved buffalo stone that's now resting at Lone Rock. And I guess my question um, is surrounding, I guess, the representation of a, for like a sacred rock that's <laughs> been moved. And um, I'm curious, like, I guess, in your experience of, um, I mean, I think we come from very different perspectives. <laughs> so I'm just curious about um, your experience in working with the stones, moving the stones, um, and also representing yourself with the stones. I just would like maybe for you to chat a little bit about that. Um, moving a sacred stone, I'm not the person to ask about that. I do, Tasha, Tasha Hubbard told me this really great story um, a few years back because I she knew I worked with rocks. And down, I think it's North Dakota or Montana, one of the two, I can't remember, but you can find it on the internet. But this, there was a, a buffalo stone outside of this town 
where I guess when they first built the town, they they weren't sure. They knew it meant a lot to the indigenous people of that area. So that you know, they left the stone alone, but then the ceremony stopped. And apparently there was the stone started, you know, talking to the town people like with certain kinds of noises because it was kind of getting abused. And the townspeople actually built a hut around it. So people couldn't spray paint it or couldn't, you know, abuse it. So I don't know if I'd want to move, move a buffalo stone. Um, the stones I work with, I usually get them from like the ones that are in the exhibition. The name for um, stones from my Cookham's house uh, last summer, we went out to where my mother grew up and at, it was a sod house where she grew up. And at some point in the er, late 80s, early 90s, somebody was partying out there and they, the house got burnt down, but there's still the foundation. And you could see there was these stones where my grandmother had made um, flower beds. And when I was out there with my family, I said, oh, mom, do you mind? Do you think it's okay for me to take one of Hookham's stones from her flower bed? And she's sure, go ahead. So my brother, you know, dug it up. And it's about that big. Um, so I have that stone and then there's stones I've collected, but for the exhibition at Plug in those stones, I just went to a, to a guy that sells stones. And he, he actually came and saw my exhibition because he was all excited about the stone and how we were gonna get it in the gallery and put it down, which was quite exciting. Um, and um, so I don't, you know, I never take sacred stones. So I don't know how to feel about that. But um, yeah, now the big stone is at one of the preparatory um, Theo Sims from Plugin, because I'm just renting in Winnipeg. I've only been here since 2018, and I'm still unsure whether I want to buy a house here, but um, he owns this house. And I said, well, how about if I give you the stone? Because, you know, you're not going to be moving, and I don't, I don't want to have to move it around with me when I do move. And so it's in his yard now. And then I have the smaller rocks in it, around my fire pit in my backyard. Thanks, Lori. Sometimes people give me rocks too. Um, you know, there's like some of my friends who are settlers that grew up on the, on the prairies, you know, and their parents were farmers. And when they would do clearing, clearing the rocks out of the fields, they would find um, tools, arrowheads, you know, stuff like that. So I have one friend in Saskatoon, he's given me quite a few um, different stones, you know, mostly tools, so. Tonya, did you have a question? I love your hat and glasses, Tonya. Thank you. Necessary right now. There's a reason. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, just going back to, to Lindsay, for, before my question, uh, I'm a uh, grad supervisor uh, for Lindsay. And I have to say that she's been doing everything the right way and having ceremony and just start trying to figure out what the hell happens with this rock. And of course, nobody knows what to do with this rock now that they've moved it into this town. And, you know, right now it's encased with cement. Oh, uh, it's terrible. But Lindsay's trying to do things the right way and put it into context and she's working with elders and um, ceremony people so um, it's still nobody knows what to do with this darn rock because it's been moved so it takes out of context mm -hmm. anyways um, you guys might want to talk afterwards too so um, um, my question is more of a historical um, mm -hmm. context and I'm thinking about the discussion I've had with Lindsay Nixon um, when she was doing, uh, she was the editor for Canadian Art. We had this great discussion 
where you know she's a younger generation mm -hmm. and and represents that younger generation we're you know a generation older and before us scana and of course the group of seven but you know this generation that we're in this whole this whole circle no one's named it and no one's called it what it is and nobody like i wouldn't know what it is but no one's actually talked about that particular generation can you tell me what you're feeling about that because there is a, a market group that happens in that area i'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that and um i don't know what we would call our generation um I think it's so if I sort of think of Scanna and I remember going to meetings with um, Jim Logan was a curator in residence at the Nova Scotia Art Gallery, and this would have, must have been in the 90s, and he invited a group of us younger, like I think Ryan Rice was there, myself, Linda Young from Saskatchewan, um, <clears throat> Lynn Hill, who was a curator at the time. Oh, who else was there? There was about five or six of us. And, and then there was the old Scanna members. So Joan Cardinal Schubert was there. Jim Logan was there. Lawrence Paul, Yixri Lupton was there. Um, <clears throat> Bob Boyer was there. Alfred Youngman. Uh, was that it? That might be it. And it was weird because we were meeting in a, in a, in a conference room in the art gallery and it was just like there's this big divide between it like you know us younger ones were on one side and they were on uh, the other side um and i think it was because the art you know tribe had started and um scott Naughty and and ryan were had started doing um their group, their collective in Montreal. So I think that's sort of the difference because we, they fought to get us into galleries yeah. and then we fought to have galleries. Yeah. And I don't know what you would, what we would be called. So I, I don't know. But Are we at the end of that or, or just beginning something else for another generation? I think this newer generation, you know, they're more writing more, um, writing more, um, doing their PhDs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. I don't know if I did anything. But... We're, we're at 307 already. Um, maybe is there one or two last questions? Trying to see, look at my screen if there's any last ones. Uh, oh, Lisa, you have one. Yes, go ahead, Lisa. Hi. Okay. Um, I've been really trying my best to get my head around the question, but I guess it's more um, going to kind of come out as I I think about it. So when I look at your work, Laurie, what I really see is. Um, how it relates to me as my lived experience, where I look at the erasure of um, African Americans um, and their history. So when I'm looking at your work, I kind of feel like it's kind of hovering over um, bringing the voices of the ancestors back up and giving them their space. And I kind of feel like in my own work that I feel like it's, like it's a natural successive order of which I feel the responsibility, not a burden. I feel the responsibility. But I guess my question for you is, is there any, like, do you feel that way? And when you're working with your work, um, do you feel like it is a responsibility? <clears throat> and if so, like, how do you work through it? Like, how do you work through the responsibility, but also the survival? in the way of how working in these traumatic spaces also affect us? I hope, so a big question, but I hope there's parts in there. Um, 
I consider what I do, especially with my performance work, a continuum, what my people have always done. We've always had artists, we've always had performance in our culture. And I have, because I will use stories that aren't my stories, but I get permission. Um, I, of course, I have a responsibility to whose ever story, like even to Miss Dastany, I have a responsibility to represent that, that story um, in a good way. And I'm trying to think the rest of your question. Um, I'm an advocate. I was raised by two parents who were advocates. And I remember always saying, oh, I'm never going to be do do what you guys do. But then I ended up doing what they did, right, which was advocating for the rights of Indigenous artists in, in Canada. And I still do. And I do it in the academy now, um, you know, working at a university and uh, being one of the first Indigenous people hired at the university where I teach in the school that I teach for, you know, um, I just have a, I have a responsibility to my children also, you know, to like make these places better so that they don't have to do the same fight. Because it gets exhausting. But I've learned how to do it where I try not burn out anymore with it. And um, I also, too, will not be silenced because of my ancestors fought too hard for me to be here. And there's no way I'm going to be silenced. And, you know, sometimes it gets me into trouble. But what's the most someone can do to me or what's the most... Uh, institution can do to me I mean fire me so what I'll just go work somewhere else you know um and, and not wanting to feel like I'm controlled to like as an indigenous person because so we were such controlled people once we got put on reserves you know right down to not being able to do our ceremony and not being able to gather not being able to touch your child. Like my mom, she lives alone and my sister goes stays with her, you know, maybe a couple times out of the week. And she goes, she shops at Costco, like she's 88. And I'm just like, why are you shopping at Costco? And she said, it's because I think because we starved when we were kids, you know, like even when, before they went to residential school because the Indian agent, you know, controlled all their movements. So they were even starving before that. And my grandfather had cattle, but they couldn't kill the cattle to eat the cattle because it was illegal. And he was a, he was a farmer and he couldn't get permission to get equipment to fix his equipment. So that equipment still sits because the indigenous men became such good good farmers that, you know, it's scared. It scared the government, it scared the Indian agent. And the Indian agent was, they were assholes, you know, majority of them. So I don't know if I answered your question. I think you did an even more and thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're at, uh, 315 almost so maybe I'll just wrap up and, and just say a, a huge thanks again Laurie it was a terrific presentation and a terrific and important discussion so I, I can't thank you enough and maybe I'll just do a <laughs> kind of clap for everyone uh, and thank you for inviting me and in, um, for me to be able to experience my first zoom <laughs> artist talk you know um, because right. I, yeah, like I said, I've, I've done conversations, I've done panels, but I've never done an artist talk, which when I think about it is interesting. So, well, you did a terrific job. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> there you go. 
All right, well, thank you everyone. And uh, it was great to see everyone and have this discussion. And again, stay tuned for our next uh, talk, October 12th. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming everyone. Um, and have fun in London, Sean. Sorry, I'm not going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take care. Sean and I are in a show together, so.